My name is Don Chandler, and they've asked me to come this afternoon and talk a little bit about Cotton Hall and how we renovated and developed Cotton Hall. But, uh, you know, when you start talking about a project that you got so much heart and soul in, uh, it's hard to limit it to just those words. So I'll give you a little history of how I got hooked up to it. In 1990-91, my wife was president of the Arts Council. And a lady by the name of Miss Joy Jeans came up with this brainstorm idea that we were going to use the arts to help the economy, the culture, and I guess the culture and the economic development of our small town. Well, it seemed like a pretty good idea to a lot of folks in Miller County. So we bought into that idea. The idea was that we were going to use those arts and we had a director come down and begin to talk to us about what we could do with a show using the arts in this town. So uh, we went out and we started talking with folks about that. And what you do as far as bringing people into the show was you'd ask your uncle or your aunt, your best friend, to be a part of it, to tell us some stories that we could recreate and put on stage. So that's how this project began to get rolling. Uh, 91, 92, uh, and I guess 93 is when we really got together and put together a little thing called Swamp Gravy Sketches. We had a talent show to see if we could spark some interest in being a part of it. That was all in that formative years between 92 up until 1994 when we finally found a home. That home is Cotton Hall. But now I can tell you a little bit about this theater we developed. We were looking for a place. We'd been performing in the high school auditorium and we filled the bleachers, uh, the seats in that auditorium several times. But we really wanted a place to put some identity to this project we were working on. We had no idea where it was going. We were just doing things day by day as it hit us. But what was always important to us was we were telling stories of people of our community, their histories. It was a way of bragging about, we're boastful folks, I got to admit it. And we were telling their stories and letting their stories relive in our town. But we didn't have a home. So we talked to a local businessman who had an old cotton warehouse, about 100 years old. And he'd been using it for a dump. Basically it was an old warehouse with no lights, no utilities. And we all went down to take a look at it and it was a dungeon. We walked in with the flashlights shining around and there were boards and timbers that had been pulled from everywhere around this town that were stored here. An antique car or two sitting over in the corner. And along the entire back wall was the actual structure of what this building was all about. A cotton warehouse, a platform. They sold fertilized chemicals, those sorts of things. And it was all along that back wall, still some of the remnants of those days when this operation was really in, you know, working. But it had laid dormant for so many years. The dust, <laughs> it had dirt floors. So we started talking about what we were going to do, where we were going to get the manpower to do that sort of thing. And we were as volunteers were working all we could do to just try to put something together. Well, I worked with the Georgia Department of Corrections at that time and uh, the probation division. And we had a project that was about probationers doing community service, you know, giving back to the community for what they had done for wrongfully to the communities. And we had a project over in Moultrie, Georgia, called a detention center, where people were sentenced by the Superior Courts to serve time there. They would serve up to a, a year there, but the typical stay was 180 days. And part of that project was that they had to come and do community service in the local communities. So I made a request to the superintendent over there and asked him to come look at our project and see if we would qualify for some help. And, and we did. Boy, did we get some help. For about six months, there were groups of people coming over here, 15, 30 at a time, depending on what details they could spare us into us. And we began to clean out this warehouse. We hauled off stuff after stuff on top of stuff. Uh, and we found out real quickly that we were not going to be able to take on this entire building at one time. And there was an upcoming show that Richard Gere wanted to put in this theater. So we hung curtains 
along one particular section and we roped off some areas and we bought the school bleachers from the high school football team. Brought them in here and set them up. The detention center guys did that. They hauled off that fertilizer. They cleaned up all that lumber. Man hour after man hour after man hour. And we as volunteers were right here helping them, working hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder. And there was a spirit of putting this project together that began to develop at that time that continues to roll now. When we got our project up and got all those things up to put a show together, we didn't have any restrooms. We put our first show together and we'd do a half, we'd do the first act and then we'd take water hoses and wet down the floors because the dust was so bad in this theater. At halftime, they'd go across the street to the fire department. The fire department let us use their restrooms. <laughs> Boy, we thought we were something when we got indoor plumbing. But all those projects that talk about this building, it was what kept driving us was the mission behind it. The original thing that we talked about, we're doing it for our small hometown. We're doing it for the people of Miller County as we tell their stories. And that's what drives me to still be in this project. Uh, the Cotton Hall Warehouse, how did we acquire it? As I said, a local businessman told us we could use it, and he loaned it to us. And we did a show in 1994. And you'll hear later about the guy that bought this building and gave us the title. After being involved in the show and seeing a show performed, and I won't speak to that, but it's something I'm very, very proud of. It is an example of how this show moves people to do great things. Uh, renovation of Cotton Hall, uh, a continued project. We sold bricks and roots and <laughs> pavers and everything else in the world. We went out on fundraising projects to local auctions, farm equipment auctions, and we grilled hamburgers and singed the hairs off our arms and face as we sold hamburgers as a fundraiser to build money for this project. It started as a dirt floor campaign represented by what I feared it was, a dirt floor. It continues to impress me uh, as to what it does for the people that come and see our show. And I know I've talked a lot more than just about this building. Talk about how we rewarded the guys that did the roof. As I told you, those guys that came over here, they were actually under Superior Court order to serve out their time and do community service over there and pay retribution back to the community. And they were supposed to be treated like inmates. But as they worked hand in hand with the volunteers over here, you know, relationships developed and people began to know these guys by name. And uh, We had an old junior store right across the street called Bernard's. And they opened up a charge account for them over there and allowed them to go over there and get drinks and cookies and cigarettes and everything else in the world over there and just charge it to the arts camp. Well, I found out about that and in my official capacity had to put a stop to that. But that, again, is another example of how volunteers reaching out for more and more volunteers and how this project uh, has the impact on lots of folks. Uh, probationers gained from being involved with this. We definitely gained from the free manpower that was given to us by the Department of Corrections for uh, six months at least, period. And the steak supper? We did have a steak supper that uh, was done uh, as a show of gratitude to those guys that had done so much for us over here. The initial stages is we didn't have any money to pay for qualified carpenters or electricians or that sort of stuff. And so that was mentioned to me about what we needed to do as far as professional grade quality folks rather than just people that could push a broom or tote lumber. And so, uh, again, we went back to the source with the Department of Correction and those detainees, as they were called, and we solicited carpenters and electricians and they came over and under the guidance of local businessmen who had the credentials and uh, uh, began to put this theater together. Uh, building platforms and building part of the theater and doing the electrical work, all free gratis, all volunteer stuff. 
Now theirs wasn't exactly volunteers, but uh, it was something that they had to do back. But uh, actually, the, it got around in the detention center over there, the best duty on any of your detail. They sent out about 15 or 20 details every day of 10 to 15 guys across the state. But the best duty was to come to Cotton Hall and work in Cotton Hall because of the people that was over here. Uh, they we, got to see the show. we did invite them back after that. As I said, we had gave them an appreciation luncheon, and we did let them see come back and under special authority uh, from the Department of Corrections and the Commissioner of the Department of Correction allowed them to come off duty one night and come over here and watch the show. So uh, that was their reward for all the hard work they did. Speak to me about what else you want me to tell you. That was great, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. That was, is there anything you'd like for us to know? Uh, any, any stories you want to relate? Any particular? Um, was Has there ever been a time where uh, the building's flooded or the power went out? <laughs> We were in a theater in a show one night in the middle of a, of a performance, and I'll never forget it. Jay Funderburk was a, a local business guy, and he was up here on the on the platform, and he was he was doing his thing, and he was saying all the lines he was supposed to. And we had a tin building on this on this theater at that time, and it was raining so hard that all you could hear was the showers hitting the top of the building. Miss Joy, you might be in the way of that can. Oh, yeah. uh, right. <laughs> but all you could hear, all you could hear was the rain, and uh, so in the middle of that performance, me being not very shy in front of this group, stood up and said, "Jay, I can't hear a thing you're saying." And Debbie Sloan was standing to my left, and I said, "Debbie, how about lead us in a song of some sort?" She started singing. Steve Hacker picked up the music. We performed just ad-lib performance of songs and different people that was in the cast would sing songs together and that sort of stuff for about 15 or 20 minutes. The rain stopped. I stepped forward and said, okay, Jay, back to where you were. And on we went with the show. The people in the audience did not know that that was not a planned event. But it was just one of those things of how we just keep on keeping on when something happens to us. Miss Joyce told me for years that I've always said this is like having church. Can't do this without being emotional, Joy. <laughs> Where are you gonna cry with me? <laughs> it does speak to your heart because I, many, many people in this town have put their heart and their soul in this project for so long. And when you see the good it's done, when you look at the small kids that started it too, that are going on and become professional, writers, one of them, as a matter of fact. When you see the others that, that uh, stand before groups and aren't shy about standing before a group, that have the confidence in themselves to become leaders of the future, that's the impact that we're having culturally in our town. We're raising some pretty good folks in this town, and Swamp Grave, you ought to take some credit for being a part of that. And with that, I'll stop. I guess I got a little too serious when I started talking about the emotion and that sort of stuff of swamp gravy and what it represents to me so they've asked me to tell you some maybe a little light-hearted stuff that happens in this place uh, and when live theater you never know what's going to come off and uh, i've told by some really good actors that basically what you deal with is, is you deal with whatever's thrown at you during a performance uh you got to be light on your feet and if you don't know your lines you're just in trouble but you gotta know the story behind it well enough to just carry on. A particular scene that, that I'll share with you was one of the brought down the house one night, and it's one that stays with me to this day. Uh, you know, I'm a little small in statute, and we were playing a scene where a man was going camping with two of his buddies, and those two buddies were big, huge guys. And what we were doing was enacting that this, this young man had his daughter the night before had painted his toenails red. And they were going on a camping trip and he was didn't have time to clean up his nails. But in the scene, it's taking place on this old truck body over here and it's a small area when you get two big guys and me sitting on two crates. 
And we were enacting going through a wooded area and bouncing around like the truck was bouncing us. And I was jarring from one side to the other. And uh, one of the actors bumped me on the right and I fell left. And a man named Mr. Farrell Keaton, who was a huge man, he fell off the crate. And what happened on the side of that crate, these crates are put together by nails and sometimes those nails work back loose. And a nail sticking up on the edge of the crate. Well, as Mr. Farrell went over the edge of that crate, that nail caught him in a very precarious spot right in the seat of his britches and ripped his pants. I meant an eight-inch gash down his pants. <laughs> the audience went crazy because Farrell had on red, long-handled bloomers. And... Uh, Again, he was a huge man, and, and we were trying to kill, carry on with the scene. Laughter broke out, and as the laughter subsided, I thought, hmm, something has to happen here. So I punched the other actor in the, in the side, and I said, stop the truck, stop the truck. I jumped up, and I extended my hand to Mr. Farrell Keaton, and I said, here, get back in this truck before you get run over. And I attempted to pick him up, and I pulled on his arm, and me being small and him being large, that didn't work. All it did was begin to spin him around on his rump <laughs> with his feet in the air and his bloomers hanging out. So I spun him around a couple of times, and it was like uh, it, I couldn't get him up. Well, he finally flipped over and got on his knees and crawled back up, in, up on the crate and sat back down. And the crowd was just going crazy. It didn't matter what we said at that point in time. But they were just dying laughing. And so we got back and completed the scene, which I think you'll get to see a little later. They're going to video some of that. So it'll be real fun for you. I'm setting up the scene for later, I guess. But uh, so we got off stage. And Mr. Farrell is, is, you know, I'm old. Mr. Farrell's older than I am. And so, you know, I was worried, so worried that I was in trouble for knocking Mr. Keaton off the bench. We went, exited, and as we went outside the theater, Farrell grabbed me by the shoulders and looked me dead in the face and says, I think we ought to do it that way every time. <laughs> the, the other, you know, we talk about, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we were talking about the warehouse and what it was, a storage room, and how it was all... Uh, you know, like walking into years gone by. We had to put up with varmints a, a lot when we first started. And one of the varmints is, is, you know, when you have a warehouse that's made out of wood like this, mice like to hang around and what mice bring on are snakes. So one night we were in a performance here in Cotton Hall and uh, we were performing the show and all of a sudden someone grabs me by the shoulders and turns me around and there's a little snake crawling on the ground. Now, we have a full audience sitting in the theater, and I am horrified of snakes. But uh, in true fashion, reach down, grab the snake, and run out the door with him. So we killed the snake, and uh, the show went on. So, but funny things happen like that. Uh, again, the, we used to, and one of the guys that opened the show would always tell people about not bringing popcorn into the theater. He says, we try to control the varmints that hang out in Cotton Hall because, you know, this, if you drop stuff, it brings on mice and it brings on snakes and that sort of stuff. Well, see, that had a special meaning to me. That, that hung on for years that he'd always say that. But it had well, a special meaning to me because I had to haul one out of here. One and day. I've got a story. We've all got a story to tell. One we know so well. 